Hello, and welcome to the Syracuse University College of Law podcast, where we discuss cutting edge issues with our distinguished alumni and faculty. I'm Professor Shuba Ghosh. Uh, I'm the professor at uh, Syracuse University College of Law and director of the Technology Commercialization Law Program here. We're here today to discuss a, a very interesting and important and substantive copyright uh, infringement case that was decided in the Eastern District of Virginia in early January. And the case deals with some very important issues regarding uh, the liability uh, for internet service providers of downloading illegal uh, copyrighted materials. And we'll also talk a little bit about the trademark uh, issues that arise. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my guest, Michael Allen, a 1998 graduate of the College of Law, uh, who's a partner at the Washington, D.C. offices and New York offices of Steptoe & Johnson, where he's a member of the Intellectual Property and Litigation Groups, and he was the lead counsel representing uh, BMG in this important case. Welcome, Michael. So before we get into the, uh, the details of the BMG case, would you uh, describe your practice and some of your background and your interests in this area? Sure. So my background um, coming out of uh, law school was basically just general commercial litigation. So I did a number of, uh, I did a number of IP cases, patent, trade secret, and trademark, but I also did a lot of antitrust work, uh, product liability, and contract disputes and sort of, uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, litigation cases and really over the last probably 10 to 12 years my my practice has focused um, fairly exclusively on intellectual property litigation and you know right now I'm the co-chair of the copyright and the trademark practices at my firm and so that's you know that's a lot of, of the work that I do and I represent um, you know, on the trademark side, I represent a number of of uh, uh, of, of brands uh, that are in the in the luxury brand space, consumer product space, sporting goods space, and uh, manufacturing. and And I'm fortunate enough to work with a number of clients that have really extensive and well known uh, trademark portfolios. And I'm called on uh, by those folks to you know do a number of things, ranging from commenting on whether a new brand is um, is going to infringe an existing brand uh, to counsel on whether litigation is a, is a, is the right move, and if it is, to actually engage in litigation, and and so that that takes up a lot of my a lot of my practice. I also obviously do a lot in the copyright space. We represent BMG, um, which is a significant music publishing house, and a number of other uh, copyright uh, holders. And you know, on the copyright side, we do anything from you know, making sure we represent some some software startups, for example, and we help them secure their copyright registrations. You know, all the way to you know significant um, uh, cases like this uh, this um, uh, online piracy case for BMG. Yeah, and so so just to let our uh, viewers know, uh, in December of last year, the jury came back uh, with a, a twenty five million dollar verdict against Cox in favor of your client BMG. Could you give us a little bit of background of how you came to that case? Sure, and uh, yeah, that was a that was a great uh, victory for us. We were very happy. Actually, we just found out um, a couple of days ago that it was the largest verdict in Virginia, either state or federal court, last year. So we were excited about that. Uh, but I think the background to that really came. You know, I I I found my way uh, into the online piracy world. I think based a lot of, on my work for trademark owners. So working with a number of, of, of well-known brands that are frequently con counterfeited or infringed, um, you know, my practice has been focused on protecting those brands and, and figuring out creative ways to, um, to stem, you know, what is in a lot of these cases a, a major problem, um, which are attacks uh, theft of and attacks on, 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 you know, some of the most valuable assets that these companies own, these trademarks. And so and so that you know that was a natural fit for me to deal with or think about dealing with online piracy in the copyright context. Uh, because online piracy is really it's a it's a rampant problem. And 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 using uh, BitTorrent platforms and other peer-to-peer -peer networks to 
uh, to illegally trade and share and, and upload and download you know, various copyrighted content is a problem for the content industry um, overall. And lots of, uh, of there's been a lot of uh, papers written and, and, and efforts made in courts and uh, in legislative attempts to try to stem the tide of online infringement and it, nothing is really sort of it worked. And so, you know, I, I was asked to get involved uh, involved uh, on behalf of BMG to think about creative ways to address this problem and um, you know, thinking about it from the ISP side um, sort of was, uh, was the result of those efforts. Yeah, so this case goes beyond music. It covers a whole host of copyrighted content, right, as you described. Right. So, I mean, this case, obviously, the case we brought on behalf of BMG was music focused, but it, the applicability to the concept certainly goes far beyond just music. And so the basic problem, just let me, let me correct me if, I, if I'm misstating it, is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, for the copyright owners to go after the actual subscribers. They're either anonymous or they're just hard to track down. They may not even be in the U.S. They could be anywhere. Uh, but they do know where the internet service providers are, like Cox, right? That, that's what the law allows the copyright owners to, to go after. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And I mean, certainly the copyright holders and the content community could institute actions against individual infringers. There's a mechanism that they'd have to go through. They'd have to sort of go through the ISP to learn the identity of the subscriber because the subscriber is shielded. All you know is the IP address. And so right. the ISP is essentially the gatekeeper for all of that information. Okay. So content holders can uh, and certainly have in the past issued you know, subpoenas to, to ISPs like Cox and others to get the information, the individual information, but and, and institute suits. And that that is something that, you know, some portions of the music industry have tried in the past. The right. problem with that approach is that it's, you know, it's, I think in the um, Grokster or the Amster case, one of the judges described it as a teaspoon problem, mm -hmm. uh, a teaspoon solution to an ocean problem. And that's exactly what it is. It's just, there are, there are so, there's so much of this activity going on that trying to go after a handful of people that are actually doing it, it really has no deterrent effect on the activity overall. And so, you know, the ISP is a gatekeeper. If you look at the DMCA, the Digital Money and Copyright Act, there is a mechanism in there for the ISPs to to secure a safe harbor protection okay. in the event that um, uh, they are um, sought to be liable for these exact causes of action, contributory or, or vicarious liability. And there are certain things that Congress built in to have ISPs do to secure that safe harbor. So I think if you look at, um, you know, perspective, even Congress recognized that there could be some liability to ISPs. And so ISPs being the gatekeeper to this activity are really uniquely positioned to have a material effect on uh, curbing piracy, and I think Congress considered, you know, the ISPs and the content community to be partners, and, and at least should be partners in an effort to curb this activity that was sort of predicted back uh, when the DMCA was enacted. And uh, you mentioned the safe harbors. Uh, obviously, there was liability here for Cox. Uh, could you give us a sense of why they weren't able to take advantage of the safe harbors in this case? Were there things they could have done differently, or? You know, the evidence that we discovered uh, during the discovery process through the documents we, we gathered and the depositions we took really showed that um, Cox did not have a, a policy at all, really, to speak of to address repeat infringement on their network. And yeah. that's what Congress requires the ISPs to have in place in order to take advantage of the safe harbor. And what the evidence showed that we introduced to the jury was that not only did they really not have a policy, but they actually went one step further and created a system to indicate and make it look like they had a policy. And they would note in the records that they terminated subscribers, but then they would immediately reactivate them. And so, so one could go in and look, you know, if you took a superficial look at their records, it would say that they 
been terminating repeat infringers, but you know, if you pull back the curtains and sort of take a deeper dive, it, they're really not doing that. And and the judge found that that wasn't reasonable as a matter of law and actually ruled in our favor on summary judgment on that point. So it's not just simply the, the money judgment that's important here, it's also probably changing their behavior, right? Uh, so that they maybe can take advantage of the safe harbor in the future. Is that right? That's exactly right. And, you know, hopefully, you know, certainly my hope and BMG's and I think the content community overall is that the hope is that this will send a message to the ISP community overall that, you know, these notices of infringement have to be taken seriously and and that there really is an obligation on, on the part of ISPs to take action um, and, and help, you know, help stop infringement on the network. Right. And, right. You know, what, what the content community does, and, and it's done to differing degrees, is there are mechanisms that BMGs used and certainly others to detect infringement on these BitTorrent networks. And so right. there, are, there are sophisticated pieces of software that understand, you know, when somebody is actually engaging in the infringing activity and when they're making a particular, uh, they're offering a particular uh, a copyrighted work uh, for, for distribution. And, you know, what happens is the content holder notifies the ISP of, of that information. So, you know, these notifications are fairly detailed. It's, uh, uh, you know, subscriber with IP address X having port number Y, on this date infringed, you know, this specific copyrighted work, here's the hash value for the infringement, I mean, it goes into really an incredible amount of detail. And these ISPs know all of this is going on, and so um, hopefully what, what certainly the summary judgment ruling and ultimately the verdict uh, will have the effect of is, is you know, um, encouraging other ISPs that maybe yeah. perhaps have, have engaged in similar behavior to Cox to, to change their ways. So cl clarify one thing for me. So if, a, if an ISP like Cox does, can't, can't take advantage of the safe harbor, does that mean they're automatically liable for copyright infringement? You talked about secondary liability and these other things. Could you flesh that out a little bit for us? Um, that's really an excellent point. And that was a, a main you know, issue that we focused on um, you know, throughout, the, throughout the case and certainly at trial. The answer is no. If they don't meet the safe harbor, that doesn't mean that they're automatically liable. So, so you know, what 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 we or the content holder has to prove as a as a as a basic matter of proof to make out the prima facie case is that the various elements of both contributory, well, either contributory infringement or vicarious liability are met. And just to clarify, the jury found that there was contributory but not vicarious infringement right. here, right? And so these cases must get pretty technical. I mean, I, I, how do you deal with the judges and juries who may, you know, just view internet as something you just switch on and off or you have a remote control button or something, but you really kind of have to know how the systems operate and in a fairly technical level, how do you confront those challenges as a litigator? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And obviously there is, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, of, of technical there's a, there's a big technical aspect to not only the software that's used to detect infringement on these networks, but in, in essence, how BitTorrent works in, generally, in general. And we had to explain, um, you know, we had to explain those concepts to the jury, um, not only how, bit, how the platform works, how peers end up transferring and sharing files back and forth, but how the, how the system goes in and actually detects those infringements. And, what specific what what specifically is done in that regard and things got pretty granular in the case uh, on those issues and you know but it's much like a patent case where you deal with you know you're always dealing with highly technical issues mm -hmm. and so what we did and and what um, the other side did as well was we had a number of expert witnesses come in explain not only the technology in terms of um, how BitTorrent works, but uh, the technology in terms of how the software goes in and what it does and what it doesn't do. And so there were, you know, two to three technical experts in the case that explained these issues to the jury with a host of tutorials and, and slides and, um, 
you know, at its basic level, if you it, it, it's not all that complicated. It's really much like sort of any technology. You can it can be explained at a certain level, and that's you know that's what the parties did in this case. And so it's also interesting to show how technologically complex all of these issues are. And we might want to talk a little bit about that as uh, as we wrap up. Uh, what what do you think was the biggest lesson you learned, either as a uh, you know uh, as far as trial strategy or about law or about life <laughs> from this case? That's a good question. Uh, you know, every time I do a case, I learn something. I mean, every, you know, that's the beauty of law is you're constantly being exposed to new things, no matter how many times you've, how many times you've litigated or taken a deposition or, you know, whatever the task is, you always learn something new, usually, <laughs> usually what not to do or or you know something that worked and so in this case i would say you know one of the one of the things that we did was file this case in the eastern district of virginia which is you know is known as the rocket docket it's incredibly fast moving you know we filed the case in november very late november of 2014 and you know we were in trial on december 2nd of 2015 and really the bulk of the work took place between March and in the trial. So, when you're on a case of this scale with that short of a time frame, preparation is absolutely the key. And I remember reading an article from you know sort of a famous trial lawyer who said you know he was asked what's your um, key to success, and his answer was relentless preparation. And that is one thing sort of you know everyone knows that, but when you're when you're in the heat of battle on something as uh, as fast moving and as detailed and as complex as something like this, relentless preparation is absolutely the key. And so that's the one sort of takeaway that I would I would I would say uh, is now ingrained in me <laughs> from from this experience because you know the issues change, what the focus is always ends up sort of shifting to some degree. People have themes in their case and those get those get, you know, uh, focused on as the litigation proceeds, but things move and things change, and you need to be prepared and understand all the issues and how things fit in and what all the facts are. And the only way uh, to be able to adapt to those changes is preparation. And so I know you, I think you mentioned earlier that you uh, were primarily or largely doing work in trademark law before this case. Um, I hope that's accurate. I think this may have been one of your first. Which one do you like? Do you have a preference for copyright or trademark, or how would you compare? I'm sure both of them require a lot of preparation. But do uh, you have any thoughts about that in terms of the two, and maybe comment a little bit about the difference between trademark and copyright? Sure. Yeah, I love trademark law. I've done a lot of trademark law, um, but I also I'm sort of I I. I, I think of myself as a guitar player, although I'm really not. So I love the music and I love the copyright uh, work as well. Um, the trademark stuff has always been interesting. You know, the, my, my first foray into the trademark area was um, when I was an associate at, at another firm and we represented Geico in the first keyword case against Google. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, this is just incredibly cool to sort of see how trademarks fit in and obviously the intersection of technology and uh, understanding kind of the importance of a trademark as a source identifier and the importance of a trademark to a brand. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough in my career to work for, you know, some really incredible worldwide brands that, you know, the trademarks are everything. And so, protecting them, seeing, you know, understanding the business, under, understanding the importance of how the brand fits into the business and, and you know, how people try to trade off the brand and come as close to crossing the line to infringement as possible has really been interesting to see that, not only in the luxury brand space where I do, you know, a lot of trademark work, but we we do the same thing in in, in sporting goods and financial services, in uh, manufacturing, in a, in a variety of different areas, and and to see the importance of of brand protection and uh, uh, in the in preserving the source identification function of a trademark is is it's fun. 
it's interesting and, and I enjoy that a lot. A lot of the internet issues come up again with trademark infringement, right? There's some cases against eBay where the question is, can eBay be liable for selling counterfeit goods or having counterfeit goods be dis distributed you know, through its auction site, right? Absolutely. And, and there's been a number of cases like that. Um, there's a number of um, sort of swap meet type cases that are secondary liability cases in which, you know, there are these really um, sizable uh, uh, markets and swap meets throughout the country where there's a number of infringing and counterfeit items being sold with the knowledge of the purveyors of these uh, meats and they're making an enormous amount of money and so uh, certainly the secondary liability um, uh, avenue is, is available to trademark owners and several have and are continuing to take advantage of it yeah. so it's definitely uh, you know the law is a little bit different than copyright and the issues are a little bit different but it's certainly a a, um, a means and a, and a, and a and a, you know, an arrow in the quiver of trademark holders to be able to help protect their brands. Yeah, so it's a really thriving practice and a really kind of a, a rich practice for, for, for students who may be entering the field in the next uh, couple of years as well. Do you have a sort of a takeaway message about uh, your SU education in terms of uh, how it prepared you for this area of practice or practice, you know, more generally? Yeah, I mean, I look, I had a great time at Syracuse. I loved it. My father went there and uh, both my parents were undergrads there. So I have a have a have a deep uh, appreciation for the school. And certainly the, you know, I mean, there's I guess there's two basic takeaways from my law school experience were, you know, just the basics, the trial practice classes that I took, I think, clearly helped me um, to be able to deal with cases like this. And and some of the litigation tactics that I you know, have to deal with um, on a regular basis. And so that was obviously incredibly helpful. I think sort of the larger takeaway that I kind of got throughout my SU experience was to be creative. I mean, we are problem solvers as lawyers and clients call us with problems and they need help solving the problems. And it's not always easy and you have to think about different ways uh, and usually come up with creative solutions, you know, using law that's been around for a long time and the reason that it's really interesting to me particularly in the IP area is you know you have to be creatively thinking about how does this you know 30 or 40 year old case support me in my position in the and what I'm trying to solve for my client when we're dealing with technology you know in 2016 and that's intellectually challenging analytically challenging and um, you know but sort of having that education ingrained in me, uh, you know, through law school about how to think about things creatively certainly helped me, um, helped me succeed in that area. Well, thank you for your time, Michael, and thank you for your great work uh, with your comments today and on the case. We wish you the best of luck. And once again, it was great talking with you. And thanks to the audience for, for listening. I hope people found this very informative. For more information about Syracuse University College of Law, you can visit the website at law.syr.edu. Uh, please join us again next time. Thank you again.